Hi, Matrix, and welcome to another episode of Geography. And what we've got planned for you is excellent revision sessions for map work, Geography Paper 2. With just a few days left, you've got to hang up those excellence and I inspiration to ensure that you are ready for your map work Paper 2. Not for biting that there's also Geography Paper 1 to consider. But let's focus on map work paper two for geography, skills, and techniques. What we've done for you is divided this show into two segments. The first will focus on question one as well as question two. Yes, question one, your multiple choice questions, and question two, the calculations, all possible calculations that you would get in the forthcoming exam. Let's closely look at what you will need to ensure that you gain the maximum participation from the show. Ensure that you have the topographical map of Harry Smith, the one that has been used in previous exam question papers, as well as, like all good geographers, a good functional protractor, a divider to calculate distances, not forgetting that your protractor is used to calculate the true bearing, a good sizable ruler, as well as a calculator. These are the essential elements in order for you to ensure that your map work is answered and answered well. Guys, without further ado, let's look at the focus of today's lesson. In today's lesson, you should ensure that the following are and have been done. Are you familiar with topographic referencing systems and conventional symbols? From grade 10 up to this point, right before your grade 12 exam, you've been working with conventional symbols. At this stage of your matric year, you should be able to recognize all possible features by using the key on the topographical map. Obviously, when we're looking at our topographical map, that refers to the referencing system found in this section of the map. Let's go further. You have to be able to calculate scale as well as distance. Like on all interpretive questions, mostly, especially in your multiple choice questions, questions on distance and scale are very prevalent. The calculation of area, especially on topographical maps with regular features, which is most common, is what we'll be looking for. Going further down, compass directions, this we've been doing in grade 10, we've re-emphasized in grade 11, and now we're going to be consolidating it in our grade 12 content to be ready for the geography paper 2. Grid references, which if you've been watching closely, we've done in detail. Now you've got to put it into practice on this exam paper. Exact positions, which is also referring to grid reference. Contour lines and landforms gradient, cross-sections, and in this segment, we're going to draw an actual cross-section on a topographical map, and you should make sure that you have the necessary skills absorbed from this lesson to answer this question well. Remember, when it comes to cross-sections, there's two types of cross-sections, an accurate cross-section or a rough cross-section, and we will try and better understand what is the difference between the two. Going further, with cross-sections comes the calculations of vertical exaggeration. So, guys, let's get straight into it. We are working with the topographical map and the orthophoto of Harry Smith. You will note that Harry Smith lies exactly between three provinces. Sorry, two provinces and one country. The province of KwaZulu-Natal, the Free State, as well as Lesotho. But you should know that Harry Smith lies in the Free State province. So let's look at the exam question. The questions below are based on the 1 is to 50,000 topographical map. Note the map reference or map index 2829AC Harry Smith, as well as the orthophoto map. Remember, your orthophoto map is a vertical aerial photograph which has been interpolated or drawn on with contour lines as well as all different types of heights. And of part of the mapped area, 
various options are provided as possible answers to the following questions. Choose the correct answer and write only the letter A or D, which means that for all multiple choice questions, you will be given four options. Simply the number from 1.1 to 1.10 and either 1.15 and either the letter A, B, C or D. Like any other question in a geography paper too, we must always understand the location of that particular map selected for the exam. In this case, we will be looking at Harry Smith. Note, Harry Smith is located on the eastern side of South Africa, located between the province of KwaZulu-Natal, the Free State, as well as Lesotho. Note, you should make the following conclusions. As it is on the east coast, the climate of Harry Smith is largely influenced by the South Indian high pressure cell ridging in warm moist air, which makes it a moist climate. It is also located on the east coast on the lower marginal belt, which means that these slopes largely are influenced by fast flowing eastward rivers. Example, rivers like the Tugela River, which have a faster, shorter, route to take towards the Indian Ocean. Now, remember, when you get your topographical map in your exam, try to ensure that you know its location based on the map and the time of type of climate as well as geomorpho geomorphology of that particular area, which you have been consolidating from grade 10 to grade 11 onwards. Let's get straight into the question. 1.1, the map index to the north of Harry Smith is. Now, guys, a useful hint and tip. Once you've established the map index of Harry Smith, you should be able to answer this question without even referring to the map. Note, the map index of Harry Smith, in this case, let's have a look at the map, is as follows. 2829AC Harry Smith. We are looking for the map to the north. For this type of question, I would draw a block as such, divide it into block A, B, C, and D. Note, the map of Harry Smith has been established as AC. So, AC would be A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. Big block A, remember, is the first letter. C is the second letter. So when we're calculating the map index, that block would occupy the position of Harry Smith. In this question, we are asked the map to the north. Immediately, you can conclude that the map code is big block A, small block A. When we look at our options, AA is given as B. So the correct answer for the map index to the north of Harry Smith is 28 latitude, 29 longitude, A big block, A small block. Well done, guys. We're off to a great start. Let's look at the next question. 1.2, which tests projections, which you have done in grade 10. The map projection used to draw the 1 is to 50,000 topographical map of Harry Smith is. Note, we have to fill in the blank with the options given. The options given are as follows. Mercata, Robinsons, Gauss Conformal, as well as Lamberts. In order to answer the question, guys, you will have to refer to the topographical map. And I'm going to show you which section of the topographical map. If we focus on the topographical map, note the following. In the map, it refers specifically to Gauss conformal projection. So it's written on the map. To get the marks for this type of question, all you'll have to do is look at the map, determine the projection, and you should know that a topographical map is a Gauss conformal projection. So my answer for 1.2 is C. Well done, guys. Can you see that already you should be have able to answer and get the full two marks allocated to the two questions? Let's move on to 
1.3, the red road that passes through the town of Harrismith to Durban is an example of a what route. Now, red road, what you should know is the following. Once you've established the location of Harrismith, the N3 is the major highway, the National Route 3 is the major highway that links the city of Durban to the city of Johannesburg, bypassing the town of Harrismith. Now, what type of national route is this? In order to do this, this question or this type of question is requiring you to go to your reference. Let's go to the reference on our topographical map and try and determine what is the correct answer. If we look at the, the reference, you'll note the following. You have in this example a national freeway as well as a national route. In our map of Harry Smith, we've been given the possible clue that this is a red section of the route. So it's not a national freeway, it's a national route. Are we together, guys? Note if it's a thick blue line with an N on it, it's a national freeway. In this example, it's a national route because it's a thick red line with the N on it. Let's look at our options. And to complete the sentence, it's not a secondary, it's not a main, it's not an arterial, it's a national route. So my correct answer there is B. Moving on. 1.4. And now we're going to fo focus specifically in areas within the topography of Harry Smith. 1.4. The rivers in block A3 flow downhill in a what direction? And luckily, we've got an extract of the map for you to see. Notice that in this particular map, here's our rivers. What type of rivers, guys? When you are studying this section, remember, continuous blue lines, thin lines, not like your national freeways, on a map suggest that these are perennial rivers. Broken blue lines, like the ones indicated in this particular question, suggest non-perennial rivers. In order to determine the direction of any river, be it perennial or non-perennial, we refer to the contours and the types of heights given on the map. Let's look closely at this particular block reference to determine the direction of the river systems flowing. And remember, these are non-perennial rivers because it's broken blue lines. When looking at the map, immediately we are able to establish contour lines which are close together and contour lines which are far apart. Notice the following. The only hint of a height is 1797. But if I look closely to the north of the map, between the latitudes in block A3 and A4, there is a height given. And this height is given as 2263. There's my highest height, there's my lowest height. In this example, I will further refer to the contour lines. And note on the contour lines, you have heights given as well. So what can I determine from just observing these blocks? That the rivers have to flow from a higher height to a lower height. And in this case, they're flowing from the top of the mountain where there's a steep slope, to the bottom of the mountain, where there's a gentle slope. My direction, in this case, guys, is southwesterly. Are we happy? Let's look at the options given. Northeasterly, no. Southeasterly, no. Northwesterly, no. Correct. Southwesterly, the possible Accurate, sorry, the accurate answer for this section is D, southwesterly. Moving on to 1.5. The height of the trigonometrical station or trig beacon, like you've been taught, in C2 is how many meters? Now, this kind of question tests your ability to remember when a type of height is given. For example, on a map like a trig beacon, which value do you use? Let's look closely at the trig beacon in this example. 
Let's just go back to the question. C2 is this block here, and there's our trig beacon, which is trig beacon 299. Now, guys, focus closely on this question because a lot of you tend to make this error. 299 is the number of the trig beacon. It is always found above or to the side of the trig beacon. It is not a height. It is the number of that particular trig beacon or trig station. The height of the trig station is always given at the base of the triangle. In this case, there's your triangle, there's the base, so my correct height is 1757.2. Let's look at the options. And notice how the examiner tries to catch you with this type of question by giving you the number and expecting you to get that option. No. Now we've established, whenever we determine the height of a trig station, the height is always at the base of the triangle. And in this case, our answer was 1757.2, which is option B. Note how these options are given, and you could have easily got caught if you did not see the comma after the 7. So, my correct option is B. We're off to a great start, and now we're moving on to the next question, which is 1.6. The highest point on the map is found in block. And in this example, we've been given the options of A2, A3, A4, and A5. Let's have a look at the map. There's our blocks A2, 3, 4, and 5. Obviously, guys, you will note that the highest point is this particular area, which almost forms a plateau. And the highest height would be given in either A4 or A5. And in this case, note the highest height on the plateau is in A5. Let's look at our options again. And my correct answer is D, A5. And that would give me the requirements. Let's go on to the next question. In 1.7, a general question which is always occurring in most geography paper twos is the position of a particular feature on the map, especially calculating the coordinates. When it appears in the multiple choice section, you should be able to work it as almost accurately as possible. Let's look at this particular question. The coordinates of Walton Station in F4 are... And in this case, we've got an extract of the map. Here's Walton Station. Now, when I refer to my topographical map, I'm going to use this particular example. Let's get our topographical map ready. And note the following. In this example, Walton Station is given in block F11. Remember, on our screen, we've been working with an extract. Now, in order to determine the exact coordinates of Walton Station, I'm going to show you the entire extract. Here's Walton Station on the map. Note, if this is your point, you'd have to go to the first line of latitude, which is immediately above the point. We are referring to this particular line. In order to read off the latitudinal coordinates of this particular line, we will now go to the end of the map. And I will take my pen and run along this particular latitude. When I see this particular latitude, I note that it's at point 20. Note the following. 28 degrees 15 minutes is my first line of latitude. As I move over, my second line of at latitude is 28, 16, 16 minutes, 28 degrees, 17 minutes, 28 degrees, 18 minutes, 19 minutes, and 20 minutes. I'm going to go back to my point, which is Walton Station, which is located here, and show you how we can read off on the edge of the map. If Walton Station is located in this particular block, and I go to the first line of latitude, then what should I remember? I can also move to the right of my map, and note the answer there is given as 20. Note the first line of latitude, 28 degrees, 
15 minutes. Then it moves on to 28 degrees 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And there's Walton Station. In order to calculate my latitude, that is the procedure. So my latitude should be 28 degrees, 20 minutes. Let's look at the longitude. We're still at Walton Station, which is located in this particular block. And now I go to my first line of longitude, which is to the left. And from there, I go further, right to the top. Now, let's determine, and it says 10 minutes. If I go to the right, this is at the maximum. If I look at my map to the left, this is at its minimum. Note, 29 degrees, 0 minutes. Note, it ends with 29 degrees, 15 minutes. From Walton Station, which is in this particular block, I go to the line to the left, and then I read off the longitudinal coordinates. If I'm starting to the right, I should remember, if this line is 29 degrees, 15 minutes, it has to decrease. So the next line is 29 degrees, 14, 29 degrees, 13, 29 degrees, 12, 29 degrees, 10, 29 degrees, sorry, 29 degrees, 11, and 29 degrees, 10 which is the line to the left of Walton Station. So my latitudinal coordinates are from there, 28 degrees, 20 minutes, 29 degrees, 10 minutes. Let's go to the options in our multiple choice. So let's look at our multiple choice options. There's Walton Station again, and note what we've done. We've moved up to the line to the top and to the line to the left. 28 degrees, 20 minutes, 29 degrees, 10 minutes. What I should note is, here's the catch. In this example, the latitude is given east and the longitude is given as south. So that is incorrect. Let's go to the next option. 28 degrees, 20 minutes, 52 seconds south, and 29 degrees, 10 minutes, 45 seconds east. This could be a possibility. Let's look at the next option. 28 degrees, 20 minutes, 15 south. This could also be a possible option. And the next one, 28 degrees, 20 minutes, 15 seconds south, 29 degrees, 45. So if you look at it, the differences are in the seconds. How can we quickly determine what is the difference in seconds? Note, let's look at our extract. The distance between that line and that line, our two lines of latitude, is always one minute. The difference between this line and this line, two lines of longitude, is also one minute. From here to here, we would be calculating in seconds. So 30 seconds would be roughly there, which is the halfway point between two lines. 45 seconds would be roughly to the middle of that point. Let me draw that in a different color. My halfway point is here, which is a rough estimate. And at 45 seconds, I would say that is the line. Note the position of Walton Station. So. From latitude coordinates, I will be able to determine that my seconds should be almost or greater than 45 seconds. If I look at my longitudes, let's use another color here. Here's my halfway point for my longitude in that block. So remember, the distance from this line to this line is one minute. The halfway point between these two lines is here. That would be 45 seconds. So what I should know is that Walton Station is located, let's get Walton Station in yellow. Walton Station is here, which is almost on the 45 second latitude and greater than the 30 second longitude. If I look at the halfway point between these two points, I should be able to determine that here, 
would be 45 seconds. So I'm looking for an answer that's 45 seconds greater on the latitude and 45 seconds greater on the longitude. Let's look at the options here. And yes, guys, can you see? Here's my option there. Notice that 15 seconds is much less than 45 seconds. So my correct answer for this option is B. Why? Because of the position of Wharton Station, which is in the bottom corner. And here's my halfway points between the two. Notice that it has to be greater than 45 seconds in both examples. And the only option that is available greater than 45 seconds is option B, which has 52 seconds in the latitude and 45 seconds in the longitude. The other options in this example, the 15 seconds are much less. So my only option can be B. And that would give me the correct answer. Let's go further down into the next question. The height of the dam wall on farm Walton in G4 is how many meters? When looking at block G4, you'll note that here's the cultivated areas of Walton. Let's add some pink in there. And simply put, we are looking for the height of these particular farming areas or cultivated areas. Let's look at the options given. 1,640 meters, 1,660 meters, 1,630 meters, 1,670 meters. Let's look at the options. In this example, in this particular cultivated area, there is no option given. In this particular area, there isn't an option given. But however, there are contour lines. And if you look at the contour lines, the spot height given at this particular point is 1,655 meters above sea level, which means that the next possible contour line has to be in a 20-meter contour interval. So I would be looking for either 1,640, which is there, 1,620, which is the next contour line which, flow, which follows the route here. If I look at the top left-hand corner, it's got a contour line of 1680, 1660, 1640, and 1620, which is the very same line, which follows the height of the cultivated areas. If I go to my options, there is no 1620, and the closest height is 1630, which then would suggest that this particular answer is C. Because of the gradient of this particular area, notice how the contour line flows. The contour is at its lowest possible height in the cultiv cultivated area. So my lowest possible option in C is 1630. So guys, you've got to make sure that you are able to determine these heights by using contour lines on that particular block reference. This particular type of question requires you to look further than just what you see on the map and be able to interpolate these kinds of answers by calculating different heights on the map. Let's go further into the next question. 1.9. The slope of section of Plattberg Hill in A3 is an example of what type of slope? In order to answer this, guys, you should have been able to do structural landscapes, especially different types of slopes as shown with contour lines. Let's look at the options given before we even look at the contour lines. In this example, the possible answers are concave, terraced, gentle, and convex. Now, let's do a quick analysis of the different types of slopes you would be seeing on a topographical map. In order to see a concave slope, you should note that a concave slope has slopes where the contour lines are first close together and then far apart. This would be a, let's erase that, this would be a concave. Let's look at a terrace slope. A terrace slope has contour lines that are close together, far apart, 
and then close together again. This would mean that here's a steep slope, a gentle slope, a steep slope, a space, and a steep slope again. This would suggest a terraced slope. A gentle slope is simply contour lines that are far apart. And a convex slope, as opposed to a concave slope, is where the contour lines start off being far apart and then end up close together. So, let's look at the map. In this example, you'll note, in this particular block, you have a situation where contour lines are very close together, then end up being far apart. When contour lines are close together, it suggests a steep slope. I'm going to draw this particular example here. And when it becomes far apart, it becomes a gentle slope, which is like that. Notice the concave nature of the slope. First, it starts off being steep, which is these close contour lines. Then it becomes gentle with the far apart contour lines. And when I look at my options, the only possible option is A the concave slope. So my answer is A, which would be the concave slope. And with that, we've come to the end of our segment for the multiple choice questions. Remember, we've taken our time to ensure that you have possible options and explanations. You've got to work much faster through this section because remember, it constitutes a total of 15 marks. And with that, it's time for a break before when you come back, we will be doing our calculation segment. Thanks, guys. Welcome back, guys. And we come to the second segment of our map work geography paper two. And now we're going to be working with question two, which is your calculations. So let's get straight into it and not make and make sure that you have all the necessary equipment in the segment. A calculator is required as well, as well as further to that, a ruler, a pencil, as well as a divider for possible distance calculations. We will be looking now in detail of the types of questions that we've looked at in question one, where you were required to calculate distances as well as area and do those detailed calculations in this segment. Remember, it's about the procedure that you follow to get the correct answer. Let's look at the very first question on still the map of Harry Smith. In this question, 2.1. Calculate the approximate area of the golf course in A1 and A2 in kilometers. And note that this particular block is extracted from your Macmillan textbook. So we will now move work with our topographical map that you've been using for this particular example. Now, when we refer to A1 as well as A2 in this particular map, let's go further. I'll get my map ready and note the following. A1 and A2 are blocks on the topographical map. As we've alluded to further, there's our line of lat longitude and there's our line of longitude running down. Let's measure the distance in millimeters. As we've established, the distance between two lines in this example, and in this case we've got A1 and A2. So our blocks extend further. The distance in terms of our length, when we look closely, is 70 and let's try and be more accurate, 71 millimeters. So I'm going to write that down here. Area is equal to length times breadth. Length times breadth. My length in this example from 0 to there is 71 millimeters. 71 millimeters. And note that we are calculating in millimeters, so we need to convert that to kilometers, 0, 0,05. Let's work out the breadth times, and my breadth is, I would now place my ruler this way and measure the distance between two lines of latitude. In this example, the line of latitude 
is from 0 to that point. It's less than the 40. So in this example, I'm going to take it as 40 millimeters. And my calculation works as follows. 40 millimeters. And note, I will still have to convert it to kilometers, 0, 0,05 equals equals. Now I would take my calculator and work it out. 71 times 0 0.05 equals 3,55 kilometers. Let's put that answer in brackets. Let's work out the next one. 40 times 0 0.05 equals times 2 kilometers. So hence, always remember, kilometers times kilometers would give me an answer of kilometers squared. Let's look at it. 3.55, which is my length, times 2 equals 7,1. So my answer for the area of blocks A1 and A2 is 7,1 kilometers. Note, let's look at the calculation again. The first step is to write down the formula. In this example, length times breadth. However, note, our scale in this example we've used is millimeters. We've used millimeters, so we multiply by 0, 0,05. My length, 71 millimeters. My breadth, 40 millimeters. I multiply within brackets, 71 times 0, 0,05. That answer is written in kilometers. 40 times 0, 0,05. That answer is also written in kilometers. So my length is 3,55 kilometers, and my breadth is 2 kilometers. When I calculate, I multiply my length in kilometers times my breadth in kilometers and that gives me the answer of 7,1 kilometers squared. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is our, pos our correct answer. Let's move on to the next question. Use the information on the map to update the magnetic declination for the year 2014. Now I'm going to show you how is it possible to get this particular question correct. We go back to our map and we suggest the following. Note that the map is used in this particular example, and we will refer to the magnetic declination. Here's it on the map. It's normally contained along the margin of the map or the bottom of the map. When we look closely, we find that the mean magnetic declination is 20 degrees, 28 minutes west of True North for July 2001. The mean annual change, 8 minutes westwards. And we should wor not worry about this particular year. We should always worry about the year immediately after the mean magnetic declination. Let's go to our correct answers and referrals in order to calculate this particular option. So my first step is to determine the mean magnetic declination. And remember, we've referred to the bottom of the map where, or it could be on the margin of the map, which is the side of the map. So when you're referring to this, note the following. The mean magnetic declination is given as 20 degrees and 28 minutes. 20 degrees and 28 minutes west of true north. The mean annual change which is also information given on the map, which I will refer to just now, is all the information on the map contained at the base of this map. And we will see that the mean annual change is 8 minutes westwards. So my answer there is 8 minutes westwards. Let's go further. Now we'll calculate the number of years. In order to calculate the number of years, you should go back to the question as well as the map. The question asks you for updating the magnetic declination for the year 2014. 
So in order to calculate the updating of the map work for 2014, I will take 2014 and subtract it from the year on the map. 2014, subtract or minus the year on the map. And as we've indicated, the year on the map is the year immediately after, correct, your mean magnetic declination. When we go to the map, we see it's July 2001, simply 2001. So 2014 from 2001. If you're not sure, guys, use your calculator. And when you look at it, 2014 subtract. 2001 equals 13 years. My correct answer for number of years is 13 years. Let's go further. Now, once I've calculated my number of years and I've extracted the relevant information from the map, I can determine how the total change is going to work. And for total change, I need to determine my mean annual change as well as my year on the map or number of years. Now let's look at how this calculation is worked out. My total change is equal to, correct, my mean annual change multiplied by the number of years. Well done, guys. Can you see how important it is to extract the correct information from the map? Because this calculation builds on from correctly extracted information. Now, let's go further. Total change is equal to, we've calculated the number of years as 13. And let's go back. Our mean annual change was 8. So, multiplied by 8 equals, again, go back to your calculator, 13 times 8 equals 104, 104 degrees. Or, in our case, we're going to take out the degrees and remember, we are multiplying by the year and the minute. So this is 104 years per minute. Now, when we get this answer, we need to convert it to degrees. So I'm saying to you guys, understand the step. 13 years multiplied by 8 minutes is 104 years per minute. When I come to this step, I must remember, when the answer is greater than 60, I need to convert it to degrees and minutes. The question I will ask myself, how many times does 60 go into 104 years per minute? And in this example, 60 times 2 is 120. So it's only one time. One time does 60 go into 104. So the correct answer is 1 degree. What is the remainder? Correct, 44. And that becomes 44 minutes. This, guys, is now the corrected mean magnetic declination. With this information, we will now be able to determine the magnetic declination for 2014. We used and extracted information from the map. We calculated with our total change as well as our mean annual change. Now we use this information to calculate the magnetic declination for the present year. Let's calculate the magnetic declination for the present year using this information. So magnetic declination for 2014, and in order to do this, equals, let's go back, our mean magnetic declination is 20 degrees and 28 minutes. 20 degrees and 28 minutes. Do we add or subtract? We subtract? No, we add. Why? Because our mean annual change is westwards. When the mean annual change is westwards, and in this example, note, it was 8 minutes westwards. If it was 8 minutes eastwards, we would be subtracting on the magnetic declination. But because it's westwards, we will add. Let's go further down. 20 degrees, 28 minutes, add because our mean annual change 
is westwards. And what do we add? We add our total change. Note the total change answer, one degree and 44 minutes. One degree and 44 minutes. So what are we doing here, guys? Let's take a step back and think about what we're doing. We've calculated and updated the magnetic declination for 2014. What are we doing? We've calculated the total change, and now we're adding it to the mean magnetic declination in order to determine what is the magnetic declination for 2014. What have we got? 20 degrees, 28 minutes added to what? Total change, 1 degree, 44 minutes. Why do we add? Because the mean annual change is westwards. Let's do this calculation. 20 degrees plus 1 degree is 21 degrees. 28 minutes plus 44 minutes, and I'm going to use my calculator for that so we can be actual, ac absolutely accurate, is 72 minutes. Now, 21 degrees, 72 minutes. We've got a degree in that 72 minutes, so we can further simplify this answer. And I take that one degree. How many times does 60 go into 72? One time, which is one degree. So my answer is taking that degree over to the 21, it becomes 22. And what is my remainder? From 60 to 72, 12 minutes. Guys, do you understand this? Shoot, guys, enough for that. Let's take an ad break. You deserve one. See you soon. Let's move on to the next calculation. In this example, calculate the gradient of the slope from Trig Beacon 285 in F3 to spot height 1633. Gradient is a common occurrence in all geography paper twos. You must know your formula. And you've been taught various different formulas, and we're going to look at both. The first formula you've learned is gradient is equal to vertical, exact, sorry, vertical interval over horizontal elevation, or equivalent. A simpler formula is gradient is equal to height over distance. Let's write these down. Gradient is equal to height over distance. Or some of you have learned gradient is equal to vertical interval over horizontal equivalent or elevation. Now, in order to calculate the gradient, guys, you should be able to determine two heights. Let's look at our question to determine these two heights. The two heights are given as follows in our question. From Trig Beacon 285 in F3, and if I look at F3, there's F3. And note, the 285 is the number. Below the trig beacon, at the base of the triangle, is your height. Your height can be determined as follows, 1708,7. In this example, you should know that your height at trig beacon 285 is 1708,7. Let's look at the next possible height and spot height 1633, which is given. So what do I do? I'm going to use the formula gradient is equal to height over distance in order to simplify this concept for you. When we were given the height, we were given two heights. Let's look at the two heights. The first height is 17, let me get the map again, 1708 comma seven meters our second height as you can see on the map and in the question is 1633 here's that height over here now let's look at it height number one one six one seven zero eight comma three and our second height is one six three three note higher high height and the second one is your low height. In this example, we should note the following. 
our higher height and our lower height. The lower height is subtracted from the higher height. I'm going to use my calculator for this one. 1708.7 subtract 1633 equals, and my answer there is 75.7. 5,7 meters. And this is the difference in height between the two points. Let's look further on. Now that we've got our height, we need to calculate the distance. And in order to calculate the distance, you should note the following. The distance between the two points is measured with a ruler. A ruler will determine the distance between the two points. We measure in millimeters because millimeters in, is more accurate. When I measure the distance between the two points, I receive the following answer. The first answer is 17 millimeters. When I get 17 millimeters between the two points, I need to convert to kilometers and meters. So what do I do? Let's calculate and convert these possible options. From millimeters to kilometers, what do I do with the 17? 17 times 0, 0,05. When I use my calculator, 17 times 0 0.05 equals 0, 0,85 kilometers. Remember, my multiplication by 0, 0,05 leads me from millimeters to kilometers. What do I do to calculate from kilometers to meters? I take 0, 0,85 and multiply by 1,000. Let's look at that. Now I'm going to multiply by 1,000. So my answer times 1,000 equals 850 meters. Guys, let's take stock of what we are doing. Firstly, we are measuring the distance between the two points. I am suggesting to you, in order to measure accurately, measure the distance in millimeters. In this example, we measured 17 millimeters. What do I do with that 17 millimeters? I'm converting it to kilometers. So 17 millimeters to convert to kilometers, I multiply by 0, 0,05. 17 times 0, 0,05 is 0, 0,85 kilometers. Now I'm going to convert to meters. 0, 0,85 times 1,000 is 850. That answer brings me to 850 meters. Now, what do I have? I have a height in meters, and I have a distance in meters. Now I can substitute into my formula and calculate my answer. Let's look at this possible answer. Gradient is equal to height over distance. Note, I've calculated my height at 75,7 meters. Is equal to 75 comma seven meters over I've calculated my distance at 850 meters 850 meters now very important you've got to remember gradient is a ratio and in order to determine a ratio I've got to bring my numerator my number on the top to one 1 over something gives me 1 is to something. So I'm going to take the step a little further and show you this. I need to get the next step to 1 over something so that I can bring my final answer to 1 is to something. Do you understand that, guys? Let's work this out. In order to determine this, what must I do to 75,7 to bring it to 1? Simply put, divided by itself. Correct. So, divided by 75,7 meters. And the rule in maths, what I do to the numerator, I do to the denominator. 
that what I do to the number at the top, I do to the number at the bottom. So 75 divided by 75,7. 75,7 divided by 75,7. Let's go to the next step. Let's erase this question mark out and get our answer. Yes. 75,7 divided by 75,7 will give me an answer of 1. I've satisfied my first principle. 850 divided by 75.7 equals, and if I look closely, it's 11,228, which brings me to 11,23. 11,23. What is my ratio, guys? Let's go further. 1 over 11,23 is the same as saying 1 is to 11,23. So let's erase that question mark out. And my ratio and my final answer is 11,23. Guys, this is our gradient. What does it mean? It means that for every 11,23 meters that we walk up the slope, the slope increases in height by one meter. So what does that mean? We walk a shorter distance for the height to increase. What type of slope? It is a steep slope. The rule is, remember, if the number after the ratio is less than 100, your slope is steep. If the answer after the ratio is greater than 100, your slope is gentle. You need to look at the two points on the map. You need to look at the spacings of the contour lines because what we're doing is calculating the average gradient. Average between steep and gentle. In this case, we walk a shorter distance for the height to increase. Imagine if the answer was 120. That means my ratio would be 1 is to 120. What does it mean? we would have to walk 120 meters before the height increased by one meter. In this example, our answer was 11,23. What does that mean? We walk 11,23 meters, which is a much shorter distance, for the height to increase. Hence, the gradient is steep. And with that, guys, we've come to the end of that lesson. Remember, we focused on today your multiple choice questions, which is question one, and some of the calculations, which is question two you should be aware that these are some of the hints and tips that would assist you in order to ensure you score the maximum possible marks where possible. But what you should also notice is that you've got to read all options in your multiple choice questions in order to get the most accurate answer of the options provided. And with that, guys, until we see you again, remember, practice, 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 because it makes perfect.